Hello everyone, welcome to Secure webinar. My name is Yulia Plivaka. I'm an account manager for certification services at Secura and I'll be your host for this webinar. Today we will cover the topic of medical device security. Uh, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. It's uh, Razvan Venter, uh, group manager for uh, product manufacturers at Secura. This presentation will be followed by a Q&A session, so feel free to send uh, your questions in a chat box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Razvan, you're welcome to start the presentation. Thank you very much, Julia, and uh, good morning uh, again, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar focused on uh, medical devices, cybersecurity, and regulatory topics. Uh, we have a uh, hopefully interesting program for you today, and those are the main agenda topics. We'll start with a bit of an overview on uh, the relevant cybersecurity threats for medical devices, and then we'll spend most of our time talking about the US and European medical device cybersecurity regulations. Finally, we're going to end up with some conclusions and some suggestions regarding what standards you could use as a developer of medical devices to address those regulations in an efficient manner. So let's get started with the first topic, which is about medical devices security threats. First of all, um, during this presentation, we'll have uh, a couple of uh, polls that will uh, hopefully keep you interactive. Um, and let's kick off with the first one right now. We are curious from which domain of activity you are you are coming from, and based on that, what would be the, in, the interest in this presentation. So feel free to vote in the next uh, pop-up um, uh, screen. And let's get started with the security threats for medical devices. First of all, very simple yet extremely important question, uh, what actually is a medical device? Well, the first important thing to, uh, to, uh, to consider is that medical device is not necessarily only an, a single physical or embedded product, but it could also be a software, like for example, an application or, or a medical, uh, medical device, uh, uh, medical database or, or, or software. Um, a medical uh, device is a product that could be used to directly interact uh, with the human body or otherwise uh, capture or process information linked to, uh, to the human body or condition associated with the human body. And also it could be used to diagnose and treat a medical condition. Some examples of medical devices include um, uh, very, very obvious uh, elements such as insulin pumps or pacemakers, but also, for example, like mentioned, medical devices, uh, medical applica applications or software or other more complex uh, systems such as ultrasound or, um, or dialysis uh, systems. Also, it's important to um, discuss what would not be a medical device, at least in a definition coming from most of the regulatory environment. And for example, wellness um, uh, devices such as uh, Fitbit uh, bands or other kind of um, uh, movement tracking uh, devices, they're not considered to be a medical device by most of the regulatory environments. Now, it's time for another quick uh, poll. Um, we will soon be switching our attention to the relevant cybersecurity threats associated with medical devices, so we are very interested whether you have already considered those threats into the design of your products and if you have experience with addressing cybersecurity. So please feel free to choose your option in the pop-up that will appear shortly. And let's proceed. Um, from a um, historical point of view, medical devices are, of course, not new. They have been existing in our lives and in our hospitals for many decades, and they have a critical, important role in, um, in well, literally preserving human life. That being said, for most of the time, medical devices uh, have focused on their performance and their safety. We don't want medical devices to fail, but we want them to be as reliable and as safe as possible. In the last few years, however, also medical devices are becoming to be increasingly connected. Nowadays, it is quite normal for them, uh, both in case of consumer devices, personal devices, but also in the case of um, more complex systems that are deployed in hospitals, it is quite common for them to have a set of interfaces, both wired and wireless, such as Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, USB, headphone jacks, and so on. And those are all enhancing the functionality and the performance of the device itself. Now, of course, those functionalities are very important. For example, to take an, uh, an, a practical situation, if you have a uh, pacemaker that is implanted within your body, it is very helpful and very, very, um, very important to be able to monitor the activity of that pacemaker. For example, to check if the heart is still functioning properly or if the device itself is still functioning properly. So from that point of view, being able to link the device to, uh, to a mobile application, for example, via Bluetooth or via other wireless protocols is very important. But on the other hand, all those interfaces, despite the fact that they're introducing new, uh, interesting and important ways to interact with those devices, they're also opening the possibility for attacks, for cybersecurity attacks. Because pretty much whenever we're talking about an interface, either wired or wireless, we're talking about potential vulnerabilities or threats associated with those interfaces. Furthermore, other features, which are software updates, 
most of the times performed wirelessly over the years software updates. There are also the possibility to implant bugs, malicious bugs into those devices to capture data or, or, or transfer data or, or, or uh, change data. Those are also um, uh, potential weaknesses that those devices could be vulnerable for. Furthermore, one more important topic is the fact that in many of the cases, medical devices are deployed within hospital environments and those hospital environments, besides those new modern devices with their connected interfaces, they also have a lot of legacy equipment, medical systems that have been in use for already many years and at the time when they were bought and installed, they didn't already include sufficient security features. Now, even if the attack, the potential vulnerability is coming from one of those modern devices, which maybe is not that high risk, but if that attack would propagate to one of those older systems, legacy equipment, which will have a much more critical impact on the functionality of the medical system, that's of course very important. So we also want to, to avoid that. That being said, all medical devices, even if they are lower risk or higher risk, they're extremely important from a cybersecurity perspective. And it's not only theoretical, it happens um, um, unfortunately more and more uh, often in real life as well. Every once in a while we, we see those news about real attacks which have been published on medical devices. Examples could include insulin pumps or, or pacemakers. Those are um, uh, quite often published in terms of existing vulnerabilities. So that really raises the awareness of the fact that cybersecurity in this field is increasingly important and definitely rings a bell towards uh, the involvement of regulatory bodies in addressing this topic. Now, before we switch our attention to uh, those potential regulations, and in particular to US and European regulatory environment, we would like to challenge you to another quick poll. We are curious whether you have already experienced uh, working with those regulations and what would be your experience uh, towards this, as we will shortly start to discuss about those regulations in more detail. So, because of the um, uh, increasingly, uh, uh, increasingly important threats associated with the cybersecurity of medical devices that has raised the attention of regulatory bodies across multiple continents, um, in this webinar, we'll talk in more detail about um, the regulatory landscape in America, in the US, and, not, and the one in Europe, in the European Union. But similar uh, kind of regulations are also applicable in other countries uh, as well in other continents. So let's then dive into those topics in more detail, and we'll start with the US FDA regulatory landscape. Um, the US uh, FDA regulatory landscape goes up to some extent side by side with the regulations that are applicable in the European Union. The ones from the European Union we will uh, check in the second part of this webinar, so in a couple of minutes. When we talk about US regulatory uh, access uh, for medical devices, that is actually quite strictly controlled. Uh, the program has been in place for many years. It is governed by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and Every medical device that can be sold on the American market needs to go through a so-called pre-market submission process. Now, this pre-market submission process, it is not only about cybersecurity, however, it includes a strong cybersecurity chapter. And in fact, the FDA had already drafted a clear guidance for medical device manufacturers on what kind of content, what kind of evidence they expect in order to approve the market admission for a medical device. This is a public document which you can access, and it includes a clear set of requirements on what the medical device should be able to do and what kind of evidence manufacturers need to prepare in order to prepare uh, to prepare this um, pre-market submission process. So let's take a look at um, what kind of um, devices are in scope for cybersecurity and how they are split. From a cybersecurity perspective, medical devices are split into two tiers, tier one and tier two. Tier one is linked to devices that have a network connectable interface, either wired or wireless, and one way or another they're able to be connected to a network and therefore also to the internet. Tier 2 devices um, refer to devices that are not connected to the, to the internet, so devices to which the criteria for Tier 1 are not applicable. And actually, in modern uh, situations, there are not too many devices that would be totally isolated from the network, so which will fall into Tier 1, which means that, uh, which will fall into, into Tier 2, which means that most of the devices from an FDA perspective would label as Tier 1 devices. So what would be the requirements from a regulatory perspective? They are split into three main categories, security capabilities and evidence that manufacturers need to provide, risk assessment evidence, and also product labeling. So to start with the security capabilities, those are a set of uh, security controls, security functionalities that need to be embedded into the product. They are uh, described in much more detail into the document itself. But in principle, they are um, uh, including quite 
classic uh, approach towards security controls, including things such as user authentication and row separation authorization. Um, sensitive code and data integrity, application integrity for the applications and software that run on the device itself, protection of data confidentiality, detection of cybersecurity events, and also the capability to discover and respond to potential security incidents, which would be targeting this device. Those would be from a high level of security capabilities that the medical device needs to ensure. Now, uh, there's of course the topic of how can the manufacturers demonstrate that those capabilities are indeed taken into account. And the FDA guidance document is, uh, is describing that as well. It is asking for a set of documentation which will demonstrate that all of those security capabilities are properly put into the device. That will include a package of uh, necessary documentation, includes um, the way in which each of those mandatory capabilities are implemented, but also system diagrams, a complete summary of user roles, which would be applicable for a device itself, and also evidence of the performed testing that a manufacturer has put in place on a device to demonstrate that all of those security features are indeed properly implemented. Now, talking about testing, that's of course always an interesting topic because there's uh, there's always the question, what is sufficient testing? When is it too much? What, what is it too little? Or how to perfectly calibrate the testing package, testing evidence in order to meet those regulatory demands? The, the FDA document itself is actually providing some pointers regarding what kind of testing the manufacturers need to put in place. And they are mentioning that they would like to see functional security validation so um, a, a, a summary of tests which demonstrate that all of those features have been tested and from a functional perspective, from an implementation perspective, they are in place and they are working properly. But also one level further in terms of penetration testing, which, is, which already knows, assumes that the security functionalities are in place, but is testing their robustness, their efficiency against potential attacks. Vulnerability scanning evidence needs to be, needs to be provided by the manufacturer and also, where applicable, third-party test reports in cases of particular security features or security components which cannot be tested by the manufacturer itself because of lack of capacity, time, or security expertise. Switching to risk management, this is a very important process that the FDA security regulation is asking for. Um, this is a more process-oriented kind of requirement, which is asking for documentation um, describing the way in which the manufacturer is performing risk assessment, so what, what, what process is followed, what standard is followed for risk assessment, but also the results of the risk assessment activity, including the summary of the identified risks, the way in which the risks were rated, the way in which the risks were inter interpreted, and also the summary of the security controls that were defined and implemented in order to address those risks, as well as the justification of the residual risk. The conclusion of this um, exercise for risk, for risk management would be that all the residual risks are low enough such that they can be accepted by the manufacturer, and therefore the resulting medical device is free from high security risks. Finally, I also mentioned that um, a, a labeling for our documentation and labeling um, aspect is included in the FDA regulation. And indeed, that's the case. Um, the regulation itself is asking for a package of documentation that manufacturers need to put in place. And those are quite straightforward elements. For example, guidance on how the product can be securely used. So how to use each of the security features of the product. For example, how to activate authentication, how to set passwords, how to deal with encryption, how to deal with software updates but also how to install the product securely into its final deployment environment, whether if whether that being the hospital infrastructure, the hospital network, or the personal use network. Also, uh, guidance regarding how to perform secure software updates need to be uh, included by the manufacturer, and sufficiently detailed system diagrams which will allow the FDA reviewers to um, uh, analyze and understand how of those security features are put into place. That was a bit about the FDA regulatory environment, so now let's switch our attention to the European regulatory environment for medical devices. And in fact, we will notice that up to a large extent, they are similar regarding the main concepts that are required for medical device manufacturers. First, a bit of introduction. The European MDR, Medical Device Regulation, is replacing the previous MDD, Medical Device Directive. The medical device regulation compliance is mandatory for any new medical devices that are coming on the European market from this year, from 2021. And it's very important to understand that medical device regulation is not a security-only regulation. In fact, security is only a small chapter in the regulation, which is strongly focused on clinical performance and quality of those products. But more about that a bit later. 
Under the MDR, medical devices are categorized into three classes. So that's one small difference compared with the FDA, which was only classifying it, them into two classes. Class one devices are applicable to most non-invasive uh, kind of products. Class two devices are applicable to most of invasive devices, but also applicable to software. We'll talk about that later on. And finally, class three devices are linked to the really highest risk medical products. So the ones who are sustaining a life function or the ones who are in direct contact with the heart or the central nervous system. Talking about software, that's a very important remark. Medical software is generally classified as class one unless it is used for directly monitoring physiological processes and in that case is classified as class two. So how would the assessment go on in line with the European medical device regulation? For class one devices, so for the ones who are having the lowest risk of performance and also cyber security, then in most of the cases, a self-assessment is accepted, a self-assessment made by the manufacturer itself, and then the manufacturer is responsible for putting together and maintaining the documentation package in line with the requirements of the MDR. However, for, however, for class two and three devices, the involvement of a so-called notified body, which is a recognized uh, third-party company approved by the medical device regulatory um, body, their involvement is, requ is required to analyze the documentation package and also perform necessary testing. We were introducing before the categories of devices under the medical device regulation in the European Union. So just to provide some examples, for class one, we mentioned that this, this applies to non-invasive devices and you can think about wheelchairs or scalpels. Class two applies to invasive devices. So then you can think about um, things such as syringes or implantable um, uh, plates implantable um, elements into the body, but also specialized software would most of the times fall into class two, unless it is um, uh, low risk software, then it will fall into class one. And finally, class three is dealing with really high risk medical devices, the ones who have um, uh, either a direct um, uh, direct impact on, on life sustaining the function or in touch with the nervous system. And as an example, you can think about pacemakers or um, more sophisticated dialysis systems. We mentioned before that the medical device regulation is not only a security regulation, and that is indeed correct. Um, in fact, only a small subset of the requirements need to be interpreted and taken into account from a security perspective. Luckily, the medical uh, device regulatory bodies have published a guidance document, which goes hand in hand with the regulation itself. And this guidance document is highlighting all the requirements that medical device manufacturers need to take into account for ensuring a sufficient level of security into their product. This diagram is taken from the guidance document as well, and over the next slides, we will also summarize what are the main topics and requirements that need to be taken into account for the medical device regulation. So those main requirements could be split into the three items, which are security controls and state of the art embedded into the medical device, but also requirements that, that deal with the risk management processes into the, into the product itself, as well as um, uh, requirements dealing with product guidance and sufficient labeling included into the device. Now, to start with the first uh, category, medical device uh, security controls, those are going um, uh, quite in line with the expectations also from the, uh, from the FDA uh, regulation. However, there are some, uh, some small differences, uh, especially in the matter of how to interpret those requirements, which we will try to highlight in the rest of those uh, slides for the UMDR. First of all, the regulation itself is a bit broad, a bit vague when it, when it comes to the definition of the actual security controls to be mandatory in the medical device. It simply asks for state of the art concerning security features without defining further what state of the art means. But more about that later on, we'll try to provide some clarity in this. Furthermore, additional security controls that manufacturers need to take into account are dealing with the robustness of the security features that they integrate. So how, how robust are those features? For example, with respect to pen testing, um, to, 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 to performing pen testing or to, or to analyzing potential um, uh, threats, potential attacks on those features. But also controls which are linked to the way in which those features and those products are integrated into the final operational environment, whether in the hospital network or um, if, if they are for simple consumer use or, or home use, how can those be safely and securely integrated into the home networks? Also, requirements are about the secure calibration and periodic maintenance of those products. And also, finally, how do they behave in case of a potential security incident? How is the reliability of those uh, devices ensured in case of a security incident? And for example, just think about an implantable device like a pacemaker. It is, of course, very critical that this device remains stable and continues, continues to operate. 
in case of a potential denial of service attack on this device. Now, we mentioned state-of-the-art a couple of times, and the regulation itself doesn't define very clearly state-of-the-art. It asks for the manufacturers themselves to, uh, to understand and define what does state-of-the-art respecting respect, uh, cybersecurity mean for a medical device. So let's try to spend a couple of minutes understanding this concept a bit better. State-of-the-art, of course, needs to be understood from the perspective of what are the most meaningful security controls and security features that could be embedded into the product itself. And some examples go hand in hand with um, with recognized standards in this domain, include things such as user authentication, user authorization, role separation, also security of software updates, also the capacity of the device to check for software vulnerabilities and to ensure that there are no software vulnerabilities existing in its code, and also things such as resilience against attacks or protection um, on the interfaces, whether they are wired or wireless. So those are the main directions in which state-of-the-art should be understood by uh, medical device manufacturers. Later on, towards the end of this webinar, we will also uh, introduce a standard which could be used by manufacturers and, the, and developers of those products to help them implement state-of-the-art. But for now, this is what you can expect whenever the regulation is asking about sufficient state-of-the-art controls introduced into the product. Now it's time for another uh, quick poll. Um, we will soon start to discuss about relevant standards applicable to medical devices, and we are very curious whether we have already experience with such with such standards, and in particular with the ANSI UL 2900 standard, for which we will um, discuss a bit more later on. Before then, let's uh, finish our walk through uh, the medical device, um, the EU medical device uh, regulation, which also contains a chapter focused on risk management. Now, you will notice that those requirements are relatively similar with the ones from the FDA, and that actually makes sense because risk management is, um, is quite a common process in general. The EU MDR is also asking for the process itself that was followed by the developer, um, also for the plan for risk management, so what was the scope for, provide, for performing the risk management on the product, the definition and final rating of the risks, and um, also very important, a plan for how the medical device manufacturer will plan to um, perform this kind of risk management also after the product gets on the market, so post-market surveillance and response plan. Very important for potential vulnerabilities, for potential risks that could become applicable after a device is already in use, either by a by, uh, by regular uh, consumer or in a hospital environment. Finally, labeling. This is also a topic that is included into the regulation. And the requirements here are relatively more straightforward than the ones uh, in the in the US FDA regulation. Those requirements are asking for clear product versioning for both hardware and the software, which is running on top of the medical device, but also clear guidance concerning the usage of the product and also clear guidance concerning the integration of the product in its end environment. If all of those documentation are available and clearly by the developer, then the labeling requirements will be. Now, after we have finished our work through the main um, two regulations that were in the scope of this webinar, the one uh, from America, the FDA regulation, and the one in the European Union, the medical device regulation, let's try to provide a bit of guidance regarding how developers could approach those regulations. And from our side, we always recommend and, and, and suggest the usage of internationally recognized standards to support Report to help in achieving compliance with various regulatory requirements. Now, the regulations themselves, both the US one and the MDR, do not ask, do not mandate manufacturers to follow or demonstrate compliance to a particular standard. With that being said, both of them are providing a range, a pool of standards that are recognized as being relevant, relevant sources to guide the development process. The FDA regulation is talking about um, the UL 2900 as a relevant um, standard, but also other standards for vulnerabilities management. And, uh, and, uh, and risk control, and also about IEC 6443 as a relevant standard, especially from um, uh, security development lifecycle and CSMS processes. On the other hand, the MDR, again, is mentioning IEC 6443, but more on the product security controls, but also ISO 14971 for risk management. So you have seen quite a lot of standards here, but now which of them to follow? Because of course, that's a very important um, a challenge, a very important questions, a question for developers. From our side, we recommend the use of ANSI UL2900, and we will um, explain a bit about why we suggest that. The standard itself is quite internationally recognized and recognized and valued in the medical, medical device manufacturers world. It is well recognized on the FDA side and also starting to get more and more recognition for the European regulation for medical devices. 
And one of its biggest values is the fact that it includes security requirements both on the features, so state of the art, but also on risk management and product documentation. Talking about security features or security controls, um, the standard is actually quite broad and takes into account requirements for things such as authentication, authorization, access control, interface protection, remote communication, software updates, and so on. So from that point of view, it can really be recognized as a relevant source of state of the art. Talking about testing, the standard itself is somewhat a test standard, even though it also includes requirements for processes, but it is going quite deep into the requirements for, for testing. And in fact, it's requiring a couple of topics, including both controls validation, so functional testing on the security controls, demonstrating that the control is actually in place, but also going one level forward and asking for penetration testing on those security controls to demonstrate that the controls are also robust. So they, they will not break, they cannot be bypassed by a hacker, even though they are implemented. Furthermore, a code review is asked um, for, uh, for each of the medical device that goes in line with the standard. And besides um, the testing and besides the code review, also the standard with a special focus on risk management. A few examples, when we talk about testing and validation, we have been discussing about validation and penetration testing. So let's um, let's explain a bit about to demonstrate that the control the security feature is in place. So for example, if you think about authentication, it will be a, a test, a relatively simpler test to demonstrate that authentication card and an unauthenticated user or with the wrong password, you cannot access the device or the software. Well, keeping the same example of authentication, if we're talking about penetration testing, it goes one level deeper. It already assumes that the authentication control is in place, but it's trying to bypass, it's trying to break this control, for example, by attempting to do um, a brute uh, attempt to, to break authentication. So by trying an, a, very, a very big number of passwords and seeing what happens. Will it be able to, uh, to get access to the device? Or will you be able to, to break the device and, and stop it from functioning? All of those would range as potential pen testing attacks. Before we continue, one more poll. Um, we are very curious um, uh, in terms of regulatory environments, which of those, um, uh, which of those processes, which of those requirements you will find to be the most challenging. And we're very interested in your answers here. Now, talking about um, code reviews, those are also uh, uh, in the scope of the UL 10900 um, uh, standard. And it is split into vulnerability and malware scanning and also static code analysis regarding malware scanning. You can think about um, scanning the codes for this. While if we talk about static code analysis, those will go for manual code analysis. So going even deeper in, in scanning and, and testing the quality and the, the, the correct implementation of the code. We have mentioned so far under standard, which we suggest for approaching those regulations. So one important conclusion is that if we take a look at this table, we see there are some common topics in both of those regulations, such as security controls instead of the art, security guidance and labeling, testing evidence, code reviews, and risk management process. And the regulations are asking for use is that they're actually going quite well in parallel in the sense that both of the regulators for them, even though slightly different form, slightly different requirements, but from a topic perspective, they are asked. And all of those topics are also in the UL 10900 standard. So that means that our selection, our suggestion of the standard would go very good as a base for addressing both of those regulations. But that being said, of course, there are some small differences and um, we will try to highlight just briefly some of those differences. There are a lot of small differences with respect to the way in which the, regulation, uh, the requirements are drafted. Learn in what they ask for. However, FDA specifically asks for a set of security capabilities, uh, which are quite well described, so the manufacturer would demonstrate the security against, while the MDR is simply asking for state of the art, so therefore they are placing the responsibility on the manufacturer to determine what is the state of the art for the medical device and how to test it. There are some slight differences in requirements regarding user guidance and labeling and documentation. I would say that the FDA goes a bit deeper in that, in really um, being more strict about what kind of guidance, what kind of labeling requirements the manufacturers need to provide, while the FDA is asking for a clear versioning and clear guidance of usage. So it's a bit 
a bit lighter, even though both of them are for third party validation by notified services for higher risk devices. While for FDA, the manufacturer, even though uh, it is it is known by uh, that by using third party testing, the process can become. We have reviewed two examples. We have seen that um, uh, nowadays modern uh, medical devices are including more and more external interfaces, either wired or wireless, which one way or another are reaching the internet. Therefore, cybersecurity threats are becoming more and more relevant. Because of that, the two regulations on the American side, the US FDA and the European MDR regulation, have started to take into account more and more cybersecurity. And at this point, in order to get access to those markets, you have to fulfill as a manufacturer, as a developer of medical devices, you have to fulfill those minimum cybersecurity requirements. The regulations themselves don't ask for a particular standard or they don't ask for a particular certification. However, um, following state-of-the-art standards and relevant standards, would definitely improve the process and would make the whole um, the whole um, uh, validation and, and compliance process a bit smoother. We talked about standards and we highlighted the example of UL10900 as a good reference standard to um, address uh, cybersecurity into a product, into a medical device. This is a very good standard to start with because it is well mapped to the requirements, to the demands of both the FDA and the MDR regulation, as we have seen in the previous slide. And it's quite a broad standard, taking into account both technical requirements, testing requirements, as well as process review and documentation requirements. And finally, from the side of Secura, we have experience with both of those regulations, so both with the FDA regulation as well as the European Medical Device Regulation, and we can support you with services such as gap analysis for each of those regulations, as well as consultancy in implementing sufficient controls and sufficient evidence for those requirements. Also, we can support you with respect to ANSI UL10900 in terms of gap analysis, testing, but also for UL10900 certification. And feel free to visit our website for more information about our services and about our fact sheets, especially linked to medical device cybersecurity. And finally, before switching to, um, to the question part of the webinar, we would like to draw our attention to our next um, sessions, which are scheduled shortly in June. First, on the 10th of June, we'll have a webinar focused on automotive and the new upcoming regulations from the UNEC on cybersecurity and software updates. And furthermore, just one day later, on the 11th of June, we'll have a workshop, part of the European project Asclepios, which aims to provide a new enhanced platform for secure and safe transfer of medical data. This will be a half-day program, and please feel free to visit our website for registering to this workshop and for the full agenda. At this point, I would like to thank you very much for your attention uh, and for uh, staying with us for the whole uh, program, and we are very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erasmus, for a really nice presentation. Now we can uh, go further with the, uh, to answer the question that we received. And uh, the first question is, uh, how would uh, an MRI scanner classify, since it's not an intrusive device? Right. Um, th th that's a very good uh, good question. In general, regarding classification of devices, uh, there are some some great gray um, areas. Uh, and an MRI device is a um, pretty complex system, and at the same time, it's also a, a higher risk system. If an attacker is able to um, to to hack into an, an an MRI device, that will have a very important security impact on the functionality of this device and also um, on on the data that the device is uh, the, the system is processing. So from that point of view, um, my suggestion for classification uh, would be in terms of the European medical device uh, regulation to go for at least class two, but potentially if the, if, uh, if the risks of usage are, are, are quite high, then to go for class three. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, what does uh, EU MDR mean for European hospitals and healthcare organizations? How they should apply, apply or use it? Very good question because um, most of the time in this webinar we have focused our attention on the medical device manufacturers and not so much on the medical device users, which are of course hospitals. The regulation itself doesn't apply to the hospitals, it applies to the manufacturers. So the manufacturers of medical products or systems, they need to, um, to follow this regulation, they need to demonstrate compliance with those requirements in order to develop and sell the products on the European market. Now, the good news from, uh, from the point of view of the hospitals is that the mission is a bit simplified. 
um, if you are a, a hospital which is residing in one of the countries of the European Union, then um, basically every product that would be available on the market that you can purchase in the European Union should already have passed the MDR clearance because uh, that is the, the requirement for the, for the product to be placed on the market in the, in the first place. So from that point of view, the medical device regulation is a bit of a, a lower concern here. However, if you decide to purchase your devices or systems from outside the European Union, then you may run the risk that those devices have not been um, have not been uh, cleared by the by the by the European Union in line with the MDR because they are not already on the market. So in that case, um, my suggestion is to be in touch with the developer and make sure that they have all the necessary regulation and security testing um, evidence to demonstrate that cybersecurity was properly taken into account for that system. Thank you. And uh, the next question is, uh, uh, UL2900 is often an overkill for manufacturers and not very explicit. On top of, uh, there are a lot of cross-references blowing it up. Why would you recommend that standard? Yeah, yeah, that's that's that, that's a good question. Um, well, to start with, we 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 always recommend standards or or best practices or or international frameworks as a good reference to address regulations. Regulations, by definition, they are they are quite vague. They're they're they are pointing towards, let's say, a higher view of the controls or the requirements that you need to in, include in your in your product. It's not only for medical devices, but also for other um, type of regulations. But they're not saying explicitly what needs to be done. They're just pointing the direction, but they're not saying what needs to be done. For what needs to be done, then it's much easier to rely to a standard which takes um, those high-level controls and it transforms them into more concrete requirements, also from a technical implementation perspective. Now, uh, there are several standards that are um, recommended by both the FDA and the MDR. We have mentioned about UL2900. We also mentioned about IEC 6443, which is also a good option. The reason why we pointed towards UL2900 is simply because it is more complete. If you take a look at IAC 6443, it's a very big family of standards. It includes requirements for security controls, which are very useful on, on one side, but on the other hand, it is not so trivial to find requirements for product development, for, for secure development. For that, you have to go to a different standard part of the same family. So altogether, in terms of you, in terms of IEC 6443, you have to put together a pretty big collection of different parts of this family to cover all the topics. While on the other hand, if you take a look at UL 2900-2-1, which is particularly made for medical devices, you have all of those requirements, all of those topics in a single package, in a single document. So you can scroll through it, you can see all the required um, state-of-the-art controls, technical controls, which can be tested, but also requirements for process analysis and also requirements for documentation and um, and risk management and labeling they're all in a single place so from that point of view for, for clarity we recommend UL 2900 furthermore uh, at this point our view after uh, discussing with several medical device manufacturers is that UL 2900 is slightly still more recognized even though IAC 6443 is getting there but at this current moment, UL 10900 is a bit more recognized in terms of medical um, uh, in, in the medical device world. So those are the reasons why we why we suggested for UL 10900. But that being said, uh, IEC 6443 could also be a very good candidate for uh, for medical device cybersecurity. Thank you. And uh, the last question for today is: uh, 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 It's impossible to have no software vulnerabilities. Is there an amount defined per thousand uh, lines of code, for instance? Um, that's 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 a good one. Um, in in principle, the product should be free from high risk vulnerabilities. This is the reason why the, the UL 2900 standard is also asking for vulnerability scanning and demonstrate the result that the product is as much as possible free from vulnerabilities. Now, it could be the case indeed um, that some of the vulnerabilities cannot be easily patched fully. But in that case, we go hand in hand with the process of risk management and risk acceptance in which all of those remaining vulnerabilities, residual vulnerabilities would be rated, converted into residual risks. And if those residual risks are small enough that they can be accepted by the, by the manufacturer together with, with clear guidance on the users on how to use the product such that they don't, let's say, reactivate those residual risks, they'll be fine. But that being said, all the high-risk vulnerabilities that are um, discovered in the product, they need to be patched such that the device in its end form, in its off-the-shelf configuration, is for sure free 
of high of, of, of a high impact security risks. That would be my advice. Thank you. And uh, this was all the questions for today. If uh, there are any questions left, we will come back to you uh, via email and uh, we reply directly. And uh, thank you again, Rasmus, for a really nice presentation. And thanks everyone for attending uh, this session. We hope to see you on our future webinars. And uh, uh, if you have a few minutes, uh, please uh, fill our survey uh, that will be uh, sent to you right after the webinar is finished. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you for, for hosting this. And thank you everyone for joining our webinar. Please feel free to reach out uh, back to us for remaining questions or for any kind of um, uh, uh, additional uh, uh, questions or topics linked to medical uh, devices, cybersecurity and regulations. Thank you once again and looking forward to uh, talk to you on our next events. Thank you. Goodbye.